Hi there, my name is Dan and I'm a graphic designer and an Adobe certified instructor for InDesign. Now I'm lucky enough to help Adobe directly with a lot of their help videos on their website. Also I get to speak at their annual conference which is Adobe Max, which is a very cool conference. In this course we are going to learn how to use InDesign to a really good level. Now InDesign is absolutely one of the essential tools for anybody that wants to work in desktop publishing or graphic design. Now this course is for complete beginners. There is no need for any experience in InDesign or graphic design or desktop publishing before. We'll work through real world projects, starting with a simple and easy flyer to get us started. Then we'll work through a longer brochure, company newsletter. We'll make business cards and take control of a longer document like an annual report. We'll work with color, picking your own colors and then working with corporate colors. Together we'll explore how to choose and use fonts like a professional. Working with images, we'll resize, adjust and crop. Throughout the course there are projects that you can complete. You can use them just to practice, but you can also use them if you want to add them to your portfolio. As part of the course as well, there's exercise files so you can play along. At the end of every video, I save my file to see where I'm at. That can be really handy for you. If you're getting a little bit lost, you can compare yours with mine. Now I'm going to give you every single design tip and trick that I've learned over the years because my goal is for you to get to the end of this video series and have all the skills necessary to make beautiful InDesign documents. This is my blue steel pause for a while look. Otherwise I finish the video and I rush towards the camera to turn it off and it kind of ruins it like this. Alright, so exercise files. Hi everyone, I've just paused myself here to add some super important new information that's come out in the latest version of InDesign. So InDesign has changed the initial view you see in InDesign. We all just need to make uh, one simple change here at the beginning of the course so that it's not confusing when you get started. So everyone open up InDesign and open up any document. So file new document. Uh, click on print and just click on any of these. I'm going to use US letter. So this is the view that you see now in the latest version. But this entire course was filmed in the slightly different workspace. It's not going to change anything we do in the course. But what you need to do is go up to window, go to workspace and go to this one here. It says essentials classic. Click on that and it goes back to how this will look throughout this course. One other thing to quickly double check is go to window, go to workspace, and once you've got this tick next to Essentials Classic, go to Reset Essentials Classic. Just kind of rejigs it all to make it look like the rest of this course. All right, friends, that is it. Do the workspace update and continue on on your merry way. Let's get this guy started again. All right, so exercise files. Uh, as part of this course, they're free. You can download them from a link just here. Now. As part of this course, um, in addition to the exercise files, I have something called the completed files. And it just means at the end of every video, what I do is I save where I'm up to, okay, and uh, upload it to every video. So you'll see a link on the page somewhere for that. You'll be able to download it. And it's helpful for you if you are doing the same video and yours just not coming out the same. And you're like, how did he do that? Okay, or why is mine different? You can open up my file, compare it with your file, and just see what the differences are. Okay, they're called completed files. The other thing you can do is there's lots of, they're not called homework, okay, but the kind of things you can do by yourself. I set some tasks. I'd love to see those projects, okay, depending on where you're watching this video, it might be the comments that you push, um, put a JPEG in of what you've done, okay, there are some places that have special places for projects, but any which way, social media, I'd love to see what you are making. Okay, the last thing I like to do, it's a bit early I know, but a review. Reviews and likes are things that really help me, okay, while I'm doing these courses, okay, help my business and help me grow and make more courses. So a review, once you're happy with the course, okay, even if you're not happy with it, feedback would be great, okay, so leave a review at any stage. Now could be a good time, maybe later.
Now, what is InDesign? Basically, it's a big desktop publishing. It's like a big version of Microsoft Word. Now, Microsoft Word gets you to a certain level, but never gets you to that kind of pro level, okay? It's quite intuitive. You can kind of teach yourself a bit of it. I've got a course, a full course on Word, if you want to go check that out, that gets into a lot more of the detail, okay? But InDesign is where you kind of, where InDesign finishes and Word, uh, sorry, where Word finishes, InDesign starts. Now, if I'm working in a design agency or a desktop publisher or a marketing or communications place and I need to make a flyer, a one page little flyer, InDesign. If I need to make a series of business cards, InDesign. If I need to make some corporate stationery, InDesign. Uh, magazines, brochures, short ones, long ones. If I've got a 400 page book that I'm actually producing, okay, InDesign is the place to go. It is by far the most essential tool in that kind of desktop publishing world. There aren't like, there are some, like some of the products for Adobe, there are direct competitors that are just as successful, but InDesign doesn't have one. Okay, it has things, there's Quark and PageMaker, which are kind of, that they're just really old versions of InDesign. Um, you can still use those things, okay, and they do a similar sort of job, but you'll find in terms of an industry tool, getting a job, and just, yeah, InDesign's the place to be for that type of work. Now that, my friends, hopefully, is what InDesign is. So what is the difference between InDesign and say Quark, Photoshop, Illustrator, PageMaker, FrameMaker, there's all sorts of other programs out there and let's quickly talk about where they all sit. So in terms of InDesign, it has some direct competitors. One would be Microsoft Word, okay, which is it's more of an amateur program, okay, you're not going to get a design job with it and it has quite a lot of limitations. You can do some nice stuff in Word, but really that's the kind of entry level program and then you move into InDesign. Now, other competitors to InDesign would be, the main one would be Quark, okay, Quark Express. Now, when I was learning, when I was doing my degree as a graphic designer, um, we all learned Quark, okay. Now, um, as soon as I kind of left my degree to get my first job, uh, InDesign got launched and I just, you know, that all those tools that I, I started actually teaching Quark way back when, okay, and it just, it slowly but surely died a death. I'm sure the people at Quark right now are, you know, they're still making versions and there are people still using it, but it's a very, very small percentage of work, okay? And pretty much any kind of new work uh, is all done in InDesign. Some legacy files you've stumbled across occasionally are done in Quark, but yeah, we don't use Quark very much anymore. Well, I don't use it at all. I haven't used it for probably about 10 years, so it's a long time dead. Now, PageMaker was, it's made by Adobe as well, and you're probably never gonna touch it unless you are, it's, it's for really big things. Say I need to put together a, a scientific document about some sort of medical treatment uh, medicine that we're making. Okay, I might open up uh, PageMaker because it allows many people to work on one document and update it and track it. Okay, if I was gonna build a nuclear reactor, I'd probably document how it's made and how it's being maintained via PageMaker. It's a, it's a big old program. Okay, so not a lot of people using that one. Okay, Def definitely not for like creative design. Okay, it's all about InDesign. Now, the other products that might go in hand in hand, okay, with InDesign is the Photoshop and Illustrator. Generally, designers will know Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign all together. Now, where they separate out, Photoshop's a nice clear difference, okay? InDesign is a layout program, okay? You bring in images, bring in text, and you combine them in amazing designs, okay? Photoshop, you open up photographs and you manipulate them, make them better, change them, mess with them, okay, fix them up. And when you're finished with them, you bring in something like InDesign. If I was making a flyer, okay, it's a one page flyer and I start making it in Photoshop, I could probably get away with it and it would be fine and you know, you could, I could make it work, but that would be using something, you know, using Photoshop, what it's not meant to be used for. You can do basic stuff like that. But as soon as you have to have multiple pages, Photoshop just falls over, okay? It can't do multiple pages, you can't have, master pages or headers and footers and it doesn't deal with type very well because it's mainly a photo editing program. So that's where Photoshop gets used. Illustrator is the one that is, is reasonably close to InDesign. It can do a lot of the same things. Illustrator is mainly for people illustrating, okay? But what I use it for mainly in that kind of design field is more logo work and making icons. It's really kind of geared, all the tool structure is around doing those things. But if I had to do a one-page flyer, 
okay? It would look great in Illustrator or InDesign. It wouldn't really matter to me. I'd have both programs open and I'd if one's open, okay? I'm good at both of them, so it doesn't really matter. Where InDesign gets used, if it's, um, if I have to start doing things, say it's gonna be a monthly newsletter or flyer, then there's some tools in InDesign that may help that flow for doing monthly stuff. Okay, the other thing for InDesign is multiple pages. Illustrator can do it. You can have what's called artboards, okay? But if you get past, like, if you've got a really image heavy document and you start getting past three, four, five pages, you'll find Illustrator starts grinding to a halt, okay? Get uh, 10 or 20 pages of images and text and it's, it's quite hard to use, okay? Start struggling as a program. Whereas InDesign, uh, you can have a 400 page document and fly through it and start working. It's engineered to deal with those lots of pages. Okay, same thing with InDesign, you can do some basic Illustrator stuff in it. There's a pen tool and you can build shapes and you can make icons and import them. So you can do that in InDesign. There's a bit of a crossover between those two. But if you're gonna separate them out, Illustrator's for doing things like branding, okay, and logos and illustrations, and InDesign is all about desktop publishing. Now, I hope that helps with some of the software and which ones you should be learning. If you're completely new to this, okay, you can start with InDesign and probably the next step would be Photoshop. Okay, unless you want to start making your own infographics and those sorts of things, then you'll look at Illustrator. I've got courses on all of those, so if you are keen, go check out those ones as well. All right, that'll be it for the what and where does InDesign sit in the world of design. Hi everyone, in this video, before we get started making this lovely flyer, we need to adjust our measurements. Okay, by default, often InDesign comes with a measurement of pikers or pickers, okay, and uh, it just means that whenever these, see this box at the top here, it's in millimeters, yours might be set to pickers, okay, when I make a rectangle, all the measurements are set to that. Or if you're just switching from imperial to metric. Okay, so let's go and change it. On a Mac, it's under InDesign CC, okay, down here to Preferences, and then down to Units and Increments, if you're on a PC, okay? It's similar, it's under Edit, then Preferences is down here, okay? And it'll have uh, Units and Increments. So on a Mac, see here I am, okay? And all you need to do here is, um, we're gonna change our horizontal, okay? And it might be on Pickers, um, and we're gonna switch it to millimeters, or we're gonna do this course in inches, okay? Just because most of the people watching my videos are American-based, okay? But you can switch it to millimeters. I'll show you a cool trick while you're working to interchange between the two. Okay, the other thing we might do here is if you're going from millimeters to inches, you might wanna change the default dictionary as well. So down here where it says dictionary, uh, just make sure you're on the most relevant dictionary. I'm on uh, English USA, you might have to switch yours to the one just up, okay? Which is UK, English, or... Okay, Chinese, whatever your dictionary is. Let's click OK. And you can see up here, that little box that I showed you earlier is now in inches. When I try and draw a rectangle, it comes up in inches. Okay, quick, easy, short video. Let's go off and start making this flyer from scratch. All right, in this video, we're gonna create our flyer document. We're gonna have the page size, this little red line around the outside, which is bleed, and our margins all set up, ready to go. Let's go and do that. Okay, so create our document. Uh, your welcome screen might look a little different. I've got all these documents that I've previously worked on. So I'm gonna go up to here and go to new. You might be on CC files or something else weird. Okay, I'm gonna click on new. If you can't see that, go up to file, new document. We all end up in the exact same place, which is here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, well, you're probably gonna be working in print. Okay, we are in this case, and it gives you some presets. You can see here, view all presets. There's a bunch of stuff we can use. We'll probably never use you compact disc anymore, but anyway, it's in there. Okay, business card, some useful sizes. Um, in terms of web, okay, and mobile sizes are done in here as well. Okay, so if you're designing InDesign for web, it's not primarily used for that, but hey-ho, you can. So we're gonna use print. In our case, we're gonna use US, we're gonna do like a flyer size, we're gonna do a half letter, okay? If you're following in a country that uses millimeters in the A sizes, this would be an A5, okay? So we use it as half an A4. So we're gonna do half our uh, US letter, okay? And we're gonna make sure, you can see you can override it over here. It still thinks I am in Europe, which I am. You can change it over here. Next thing is the orientation, okay? I wanna put it landscape. 
facing pages we're going to turn off okay and facing pages will go into in a lot more detail when we start building our like multiple page brochure further on in this course but for the moment if you're just doing a, like a one page thing turn off facing pages uh, primary text frame as well it's, it's a little bit complicated and we'll do that in a later video as well okay but just make sure they're off for the moment number of pages you can add them later if you want we're just going to start with one columns okay we're only going to have one column in this case we'll look at multiple column layout when we get into some more text heavy documents later on margins will leave as the default and yours might be a little bit different so you can see here i can see margins and uh bleed okay you might just twirl those down if you can't see them Okay, and I'm gonna to go to this bleed one here. So I've done my margins, I left them as the default bleed. What I'll do is I'll get the real Dan to jump out and show you this, because it's better in person. Take it away, Dan. So apparently I am the real Dan, and this real Dan would like to explain bleed and slug. This is my example book. Okay, now what happens when they're printing? We all know that, like say this image at the front here goes right to the edge, okay? The black goes right to the edge. The ad on the back goes right to the edge. Pretty much all of these pages, Okay, all these ads here go to the edge of the page. But we know that when we're printing, say at home or at the office, we can never print right to the edge of a white bit of paper, right? Because the printer just doesn't go that close to the edge. That's the same uh, for big commercial offset printers as well. So it doesn't really matter, you can't print right to the edge. So what happens is you print on a little bit of paper that's a little bit bigger. Okay, so say it needs to be letter or A4, what they do is they print it on a on a uh, on a sheet called SA4, which is just a little bit bigger, okay, and then they print inside of that, and then they guillotine it off afterwards down to the original size. Now that guillotine is never perfect, okay? They try and line it up perfect, but you need a little bit of wiggle room for the guillotine to maybe like slice a little bit higher or a little bit lower. You don't want it right on the edge because they might end up with a little white strip. Okay, so they what you do in InDesign is you add a little bit of bleed. Okay, three millimeters for metric or an eighth of an inch for imperial, okay, or 0.125 of an inch if you're using decimal places. And what happens is you just make your document that teeny bit bigger, okay, all the way around so that the guillotine has got something to cut off, okay, and it ends up in the bin. So nothing important there because it'll end up in the bin, okay, but it gets cut down to this final size. Happens especially with magazines. Magazines are printed and bound and often they don't look this nice. This has got a really sharp you know, kind of crisp edge, but that never happens when it gets bound. That only happens after it's been guillotined. It's quite messy. If you ever see a magazine that's been printed that doesn't yet, that hasn't been yet been um, trimmed up, okay, it's actually, the pages are all kind of like messed up and not lined up nicely. It's not until guillotining happens that, uh, yeah, and the bleed is cut off before they look nice and tidy. Now, in terms of slug, now, the cool thing about slug is you just won't use it, okay? People doing the design side often don't use slug. It's more the printing or production side of things. Let's say that, so the bleed is just like, remember, just a little bit around the outside. The slug is the is a bigger chunk, like an inch around the outside. And in that, you can write notes, okay? So if you're the printer and you know that this cover is a bit special and it has something that needs to be glued to it on a special spot, you could write, here's where this gets glued to, or maybe, this bit gets stapled to this bit and folded over or something special, okay? Or just anything that um, maybe help the production later on after it comes off the printer. It says maybe this gets put with part A and part B. So it's kind of a terrible explanation, but it's just notes that the printer adds. It'll be trimmed off and chucked in the bin. I've never had to put bleed on in my entire career you probably won't do either unless you're working maybe behind the scenes in an offset printer or a big commercial printer you might be adding blood uh blood you might be adding slug afterwards and adding these notes to it so bleed definitely slug pretty much never did that help hope it helped you can go back to the other dan the disembodied voice talking over a screen right so we know we need a bleed okay of um 0.125 inches okay or an eighth of an inch okay or if you're a metric you can just type in three millimeters you can see i can type in three millimeters and just click somewhere else and it does the conversion for me i know it's not exactly the same but that's just the way it is okay different people use different size bleeds okay and the slug we don't use you so we're going to leave that as is okay and let's click create stand back we have a document Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Zooming is Command minus on a Mac or Control minus on your keyboard, okay, if you're on a PC. 
And what I want to do is show you the different um, parts here. So the edge of the big white box is the edge of our page. In our case, it's the US half letter. Okay, and we've got these two other colored boxes here. We've got this red one and this magenta one here. Okay, so the magenta is the margins. They don't do anything. They're just a visual guide to keep everything inside and away from the edges of the page because we all know that our printers don't print right to the edge. So there's like a consistent box around the edge there. Okay, the other one we're going to look at is this red one here, and that is the bleed we discussed. So everything that goes over this edge here prepared to get chopped off and put in the bin. Before we go any further, let's go and save this document. Okay, so let's go up to File and let's go to Save. Where we're going to save it, I'm going to save one on my desktop. I'm going to make a new folder. Okay, if you're using a Mac and it's a new Mac, you might be looking like this. It looks a little different. Okay, click this little arrow here. Find your desktop on the left hand side, make a new folder. I'm going to call this one InDesign class files, click create, and we'll stick everything we make during this long course into that folder. In terms of the naming, okay, we're gonna call this one good at heart, because that's the client. Okay, I'm gonna put a hyphen in and we're gonna put in flyer, and this is gonna be V1. Always give it a version number, okay, because you're gonna make changes, people are gonna come back. A V1, V2, or ABC is just fine. Okay, never call it final. Final is like the kiss of death. If you call it final, the universe will send you adjustments and you'll have to call it like final two or final revisited. There's some people chuckling because you've probably got files just like that all over your computer. Okay, so we're gonna use the V system. Let's click save. And that's it for this video, my friends. Let's get on to the next one. Hey there, hey, I just wanted to check in and see how you're enjoying the video so far. What do you think? If you are enjoying it, can you give me a like? That'd be great. Uh, also consider subscribing to the channel. I've got lots of other stuff like this. Now there's plenty more to come, but I just wanted to remind you that this particular video is only a small part of my larger InDesign Essentials course. So there's loads more to do in that full course if you're interested. I also have an InDesign Advanced course there as well. What you're seeing in front of you now are the things that we go on to make in those courses. So check out the link for both of those in the description. If you decide to subscribe to those courses, you also get access to my Photoshop, Illustrator, Adobe XD, Premiere Pro, After Effects, and Dreamweaver courses. All right, sales pitch over. I'll let you get back to the video. Enjoy. Hi there, in this video we're going to look at adding these sexy colors over here to InDesign. We'll look at color in general, it's a little bit long this video, but it's the kind of stuff you need to know if you're going to be getting into kind of InDesign production. All right, so let's go and add some pre-made colors. Okay, before we go any further, let's just ensure your screen is looking like mine. So at the top here, go to Essentials. Okay, and if you'll say something else, I might say Advanced or something else, click up in this random area at the top here and click Essentials. I'm pretty sure on a PC it's over here as well. I remember in an earlier version it was all the way over here on the left. Double check. Okay, but find something that looks like that. Make sure it's on Essentials. And where it drops down, make sure you click on Reset Essentials as well. That means it just kind of gets it back to square one. This is handy for when you are, say, doing something and you accidentally drag this and it ends up in a weird spot down. Where's a weird spot? There it is there. And this bit goes there. And everything's a bit mixed up. Okay, and you get a bit lost. So come back to this video and go to Essentials and go to Reset Essentials and everything kind of comes back to normal. What we'll also do for this course is see these double arrows here? I prefer to have this group of tabs um, always out rather than like little clickable in and out boxes. Okay, if you've got a really small screen, you might have to keep them all pushed in. So for the moment, let's ignore this little thing over here for the moment. That's something I've added for us later on. And what we're gonna do when we're starting a new job is we've created a new page, but one of the first things you should do now is create a new CC library, okay? So you might do CC libraries per client rather than per job, okay? So if you're working at one company, you might just have one. You can see on my libraries here, I got loads of them, okay? And all they are is a place to store things like, you can see in this case, colors, uh, fonts, images. And the cool thing about it is that it's shared across all the Adobe products. You might be only using InDesign, but if you start using Photoshop or Illustrator, this library is in there as well so you can share these colors across so what we're going to do is CC libraries we're going to use this little drop down yours is probably set to my library I've got a couple of my libraries for some reason but you've got one okay I'm going to create a new library for this course okay I'm going to call this one uh, green green at heart okay you do the same and let's click create and it's just a nice empty 
library at the moment. But what it's going to do is when we add our colors, we'll add them to the library at the same time. And when we bring in images and icons, they'll go in there as well. So to add colors, okay, we're going to add corporate colors. Okay, if you are just playing around, you want to mix up any color, watch this. If I highlight this text here and just go, um, what might happen is in this case, you can see here that nice little rainbow thing that was there a second ago is now this black and white. You're going to have to switch it up here, okay, in this little fly up menu back to RGB and you'll get that color thing back again. That happens quite a bit while you're working in InDesign. But if you've got no design at the moment and you're randomly picking colors for the client or yourself, you can just use this little eyedropper down here and just randomly pick colors, okay? And that might be great. But say we're working for a client that has specific color needs, so we're gonna have to put in their corporate colors. So let's go and do that now. One of the things we'll look at is swatches are pre-made colors, okay? Now InDesign's giving you a couple of pre-made ones. There is none, so empty box. Okay, there's a registration and reasonably complicated, but at our level here, just never ever use it. I never use registration. We'll look at it a little bit more in our advanced class. We'll look at registration and plates, okay? But just ignore that one for the moment. What you wanna do is use black, not registration. Okay, so black and then there's white. They call it paper because you'd imagine if you're printing, uh, if I printed this, okay, and I was expecting this to be white, but I put blue paper in my printer, it's not gonna actually be white, is it? It's gonna be blue of the paper. So that's why they're all clever with the word paper there and not white, but it means white. Then they went and mixed in some really awful colors. Okay, these are there by default. You can delete them. You can select them all and say goodbye with the little trash can. Okay, we'll leave them there for the moment. So what we wanna do is mix our own colors. Now, you're gonna to have to find out what your corporate colors are. Okay, so you might be working at a company and they've got a corporate manual, okay, and it lists out their colors. Okay, you might have to ask the marketing department what they are or the designer that was working there or working with you or, um, so you're gonna to have to figure out what these colors are. Now to create a swatch, go into this little fly out menu here in the swatches panel, and there's one at the top here that says new color swatch. And if it doesn't have anything, okay, sometimes I've been on my type tool and I've got text selected and it's freaking out a little bit. So what I can do is just go back to my arrow, okay, and I've clicked off in the background. Now I can go through and go new color swatch. I'll pretend like I did that on purpose to show you a lesson, but really just got lost. Let's click on this top one here, it says name with color value. If you leave that on, you're gonna have colors like this, which aren't very useful, okay, the, the actual code for them. Especially when you're dealing with a client, say like me, I've worked for hundreds of companies, so if I type in green, it could be green from any company. So I'm gonna untick this, and I'm working for the green at heart, okay, and so I'm just putting the little acronym in there. You, if, you know, if you're working with Disney, put in Disney green. I'm working with green at heart, red, Okay, and what we're gonna do is the color mode. Now we're gonna be using RGB in this class, okay? You might be using, you might look at your corporate manual and they use CMYK. The times where you use each of them, RGB is probably the most common, okay? Especially if you're gonna be designing something that's gonna be viewed on a screen. So RGB is red, green, blue, and that's what your screen uses to display colors. CMYK is what your printer uses to display colors. And you'll notice it's a lot less because if you've ever printed something from your laptop and it looks awesome, and then it prints out and the printer just a little bit washed out, it's because of CMYK. Okay, RGB luckily has a bigger color field. It also has light coming out of it, luminance, okay, because your laptop screen is all bright and it's got lights in it so it can achieve those colors like the like toxic green or like a Donna Pink RGB. When you use CMYK is when you're going to a, a commercial printer or an offset printer, they call it. Okay, and that happens, depends on what you're working. If you're doing stuff and it's going to be printed in the office, send it RGB. Office printers love RGB. Even if they're um, laser color printers, they'll like RGB more. It's only if you're getting like 10,000 printed at a large printing house, they'll expect CMYK. Okay, they look very similar in terms of the colors, but the codes are slightly different. We're gonna use RGB, and here are the RGB colors that I've got. So we're gonna list all these out. So I'm gonna put in 255 for the first one, and 99, and then 88. Okay, and you see it's still at pink, but if I click out here, okay, on one of the other ones, it changes to my swatch. Okay, and what I wanna do is I'm gonna add it to my library at the same time, green at heart. You might have a different one, okay, lots of different ones. Okay, but I'm gonna add it to my green at heart at the same time. If you're confused by libraries and you just hate them and you don't wanna use them, you can untick this. Let's click add rather than okay. Why? Just means it keeps this open, okay? So I can add more colors. This one's going to be green at heart and this one's gonna be the yellow. Okay, and add another one, 255. I'm tabbing down, or click in the next box, 145. Okay, click. Actually, don't click anything because it's pink, not yellow. I think I left the two of the front of this one. OK, 
Okay, so ignore that notes over here. It should be 255255145. Okay, so I'm going to click add. You can see there it appears in my libraries. It also appears down here in my swatches, okay, and both places. So what I want you to do now is uh, pause, okay, and go through and add these. I'm gonna get Taylor, our wonderful editor, to go through and speed this up. So I'm gonna insert mine. Okay, see you then, race ya. Okay, here we are, and when you're finished, I can click Add or click OK. Either way, it closes it down. Now we need to click OK, so it's finished. Now, a couple of things. You might have clicked OK by accident. How do you get back in there? Okay, you just go back into the flyout menu and say New Color Swatch. If, like me, you've spelt one wrong, okay, I've left the green off it, you can just double click it, okay, and it opens up, and put my N in, click OK. If you forgot to tick the box at the bottom, you can select on these guys and see this little cloud kind of icon here. This will add it to the swatches over here. All right, so that's the end of this super duper long color nerd fest. I realize we're a bit into this course and we still just have a blank page, but that's okay. Okay, so that's it for this video. We're gonna move on to stealing colors from logos. Just in case you don't know what the corporate spec is, I'm gonna show you a sneaky trick to go and do that. So let's go do that in the next video. Okay, in this video is we're gonna steal colors from an image. Rather than knowing what the corporate colors are, because we don't know what they are, let's say, we're gonna go and steal them using this handy little eyedropper, then we're gonna add it to down here, okay, into our swatches panel. But before we get started, will it be the exact color from the brand guidelines and be perfect? No. Will it be close enough that nobody will notice? Yes. Okay, I don't know why I don't like stealing colors, I like to use the official numbers. Okay, but let's go and do the steely version. Okay, you rebel renegade outlaw, let's go and steal colors from a logo. Where did you get the logo from? You might have got it from uh, your website or you might have it sitting on your system somewhere. Okay, go to file and go to place. Place is what InDesign calls import. Okay, so just file place. Find the logo. If you're playing along in this tutorial, um, you download the exercise files. Okay, and inside those exercise files is what a folder called O1 Flyer. And inside of there it's called bring your own laptop logo or BYOL logo. Okay, click choose, click once on your screen, and here's the logo we wanna bring the color from. So to make this thing work, what we need to do is, see this top tool here? Just click on the background so you've got nothing selected. So just click in the no man's land here, we've got nothing selected. Then down the bottom here of our toolbar, see this one looks like an eyedropper? Click and hold it for a little while. By default, yours is probably set to the color theme tool. I want the eyedropper tool. So you click, hold, hold, hold on the mouse, and then you should be able to move over here, still holding down, grab the eyedropper tool. Now what we can do is click, it's the tippy uh, bottom left, okay, or the tip of the little eyedropper, click on that once, and nothing really happens, right? But over here in my colors panel, it, de it doesn't really matter whether it's got the stroke or the fill, we'll look at that in a second, it doesn't really matter. All you need to do now is go to this little flat menu and say add to swatches, okay? And what's happened is it's stolen that color, there it is there. I'm gonna go back to my move tool, okay, or my selection tool, and I can double click it, and that is, unnamed with color value, the bring your own laptop green. How close is it? It is not going to be absolutely 100% perfect, but it's gonna be pretty damn close. Okay, so that's a way of stealing uh, colors from a logo. It's not gonna be exact though, so you might, might, okay? There's just a big asterisk saying, don't come run to me if there's a problem, but I've never had a problem, okay? Stealing colors from logos works just fine. Okay, I'm going to click OK. You can see down the bottom here is my Bring Your Own Laptop Green. Okay, I haven't added it to my library, so with it selected, I can click on this, and then it goes over here. But because I don't want to do this, I'm going to delete that. I selected it with my selection tool. Over here, I've binned it. I don't want it in here, and I don't want it in this one either, so I'm going to right-click it, okay, and go to Delete. Back to Happiness, okay, where we've got official colors, and we're not doing any steely stuff. I don't know why I have a problem with stealing colors. I think it's design school. They beat that sort of stuff into you so you get a bit scared about borrowing, appropriating, or stealing. Okay, so that's it for this video. Let's get on to the next one. All right, in this video, we're gonna make a nice big colored background. It's gonna have no stroke around the outside, a little line, but a nice big colored fill. 
Let's go and do that. Okay, before we get started and put the um, big box in the background, we need to understand the difference between a fill and a stroke. Okay, it's reasonably easy, okay, but let's quickly look at it. So we're gonna use this tool down here, the rectangle tool. You've got two, the frame tool, okay, if I draw out a frame, or draw rectangle tool, they kind of look the same, well, kind of look the same. You can actually fill these guys with colors if you want to. Um, I never ever use the frame tool, it's totally up to you, okay? The frame tool generally gets used for like a placeholder. This is where an image is going to go, okay? I never generally have that problem, so I just leave a big hole where the image is gonna go. But you might like this little line through the middle, okay? And I'm gonna use the regular old rectangle tool the whole course. One thing is you might not be able to see it, it's because the last person that used your computer might have clicked and hold down this rectangle tool and used the ellipse tool, okay, and drawn an ellipse. Okay, and it just means it's always set to ellipse now. So hold it down, you might be able to find the rectangle tool. Let's draw a rectangle, any old size, okay? And it might have a fill, it might not. This is where it's gonna come up the top here, okay? We're gonna use this option. There's a few different ways. There's this way, there's this way, there's this way, and there's this way. They all do the same thing. If you're using any other method, you're fine, okay? But this way here I find is the easiest to learn. And it just means this top one here is the fill, the next one is the stroke. So the fill is obviously the fill in the inside, okay? So we're gonna pick uh, a fill, okay? And I'm gonna pick the mid green, okay? And in terms of the stroke, I'm gonna click back on that little arrow, and there's the stroke. And at the moment it has a little red line. Red line means none. I've got no stroke around the outside. Say if I want to put a black stroke around the outside, you see I clicked on it, it added a stroke, and you can kind of see it there. Okay, so the stroke is the line around the outside. To adjust the size of that stroke, you can see just next to it, there's a one point. It's always done in points, not millimeters or inches. Okay, and I can increase it up. Okay, can I make a nice thick stroke around the outside? What I actually want from this rectangle is I want to have no stroke. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the stroke one, I'm gonna click none, and at this top one here, I don't want this green, I want the light green, okay? Awesome. If it's not changing, you have gotta make sure you've got it selected. So grab the selection tool and just got you selected, and then make these adjustments. What I wanna do is I wanna stretch it out, because remember, we're using bleed in this case. We looked at bleed earlier on, okay? So what we're gonna do is, it's really hard to see the edges here, so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Zooming is Command minus on a Mac, or Control minus on a PC. And I'm gonna go back to my selection tool, the black arrow. I'm gonna grab this bottom right and I'm gonna drag it. Do I drag it to the edge of the white or all the way out to the red? Okay, the answer is red. Okay, same with this one here. I go, if I leave it just there, remember the bleed might get trimmed, okay, and it might leave a little white liner on the edge because there's a little, we need a little bit of overhang to make sure it can get chopped off nice and clean and crisp and clear. And remember, anything over this edge here is gonna get probably chopped into the bin. So that is how to color a background in InDesign. There's no way of going in and setting like the default bit of this to be anything but white. Okay, I'm gonna undo and we do it with a nice big rectangle. All right, that's it for this video. Let's go and start looking at importing and scaling and flipping and stuff of the images. All right, see you in the next one. Howdy partners, in this video we're gonna look at bringing in images and logos and rotating them and we'll look at this one where we've cropped it. You can see, look at this, sneaky. This one's actually a little bit bigger. Okay, so we've cropped it into a nice little box, we'll flip them, we'll do all sorts of stuff with images. All right, let's go and do that now. Okay, to bring in an image, icon, or any sort of visual graphic, it's the same, okay? First thing we need to do though, is we need to get in the habit of, if I have my black arrow selected, okay, and just click off in this dark gray area around the side here, okay, so there's nothing selected. There's a more official way, you can go to edit and go to uh, deselect all, okay? It's a long way. So. We've got nothing selected, then we're gonna to go to File, Place. Okay, remember that's Import for InDesign. Pick the um, O1 Flyer folder, and there's one there called Lunch. Now your cursor is loaded, okay, with this little image, and you've got two ways of putting it in there, okay? Now when you're bringing in images into InDesign, it can confuse you when you're new. The easiest way is, over here in the gray area, to click once. Okay, that'll bring in my image at full size. If it's coming in too big, you can go to edit and go to undo place. Okay, that kind of goes back. And what I wanna do is click, hold, and drag in this gray area. And it doesn't really matter how big, you can see that's the size of my image. If it's coming through really, really big, just click and drag it out to a more appropriate size. Okay, the reason I do that is I'm gonna go to edit, undo again. 
okay, or Control Z on a Mac or Command Z on a PC, so undone. If I click it on this green box here, the icon changes, it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, Taylor will zoom in for us so he can kind of, so you can kind of see the brackets appear. Okay, all it means is if I click on this, it's kind of merged them together, my green box is gone forever. You might want that, that's cool, so you can do that. But what I do is, I find that's always a pain, Edit, undo, undo, undo. Okay, I'm gonna keep going undo until that's back and remember, I can just click once out here in the background. Okay, let's look at some of the things we can do with images. First of all, is probably you would want to resize them. Okay, so resizing them seems easy. You grab the black arrow, you grab the corner and you drag it up and weirdly it does that by default. Okay, lovely InDesign. Okay, I'm gonna undo. So what we need to do is our first shortcut. We're not gonna to learn too many in this course. There's gonna be a cheat sheet at the end for loads of shortcuts, but what we wanna do is learn a couple of the more practical ones. And in this case, it's resizing an image, okay? And you hold down on a Mac, it's Command and Shift. If you're on a PC, it's Control and Shift. Hold those two down your keyboard, you're holding. Okay, grab this corner now and drag it up. Okay, and you see it resizes. Strange long shortcut, I know, it's just the way InDesign is, and we can resize it that way. To rotate it, there's a manual rotation at the top here, so there's a little indicator if I need it to be 45 degrees, I can just type it in and it rotates. I'm gonna undo. Okay, if you wanna do it just more kind of casually or you're just kind of playing with the design, okay, is with the same black arrow, hover, you can see on the edge here, it does the resizing thing, okay? But if I hover just a bit further out, you can see my icon changes. It's this little double-headed arrow. I can click, hold, and drag that now, and you can see it clicking, holding, and dragging, and it's more of a custom rotation. I'm gonna undo that. Another thing we might do is flip it. Okay, so up the top here, so I've got it selected with my black arrow, and there's this options here that flips it horizontally. Sometimes it ends up all the way over here, and you gotta click and drag it back across, and flipping it vertically, um, does it up the top there as well. Okay, so I'm gonna undo, 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 and we haven't got a flipped image. The next thing we're gonna look at is something called the content grabber. Okay, it's this little target that appears. Now, when you're trying to just move your um, image around, so I need to move it down the bottom here, avoid this thing completely. Okay, so I'm gonna click and drag anywhere but there and I can move it around. If I drag this, what happens is, in InDesign, your image is actually inside a picture frame already. Okay, so they're two separate things and you can move them individually, which is quite handy sometimes, but can be a bit annoying when you're learning. Okay, so if I click and drag this, okay, content grabber, You'll see the frame, you see him there? That's the edge of him. He's still there, but the picture within that frame has slid to the side. And that can be quite cool when you're trying to crop things. Okay, and I can grab it, drag it back. Okay, but I'm gonna undo a couple of times. Remember, edit, undo. Okay, I'm gonna use my shortcut. So what you need to do is if you're physically moving it, click anywhere but the target. But if you wanna move it within the frame, you can drag that little content grabber and undo. If you really don't like the content grabber, secret note, I don't like it. Okay, and I turn this off, I go to view, and I go to extras, and I go to hide content grabber. Okay, there are other ways of cropping stuff. Up to you. Okay, you don't have to turn it off. You might love it. Lots of people do. Um, what we're going to do now is look at some basic cropping, because what I want to do is I would like this thing, let's click, hold, and drag it so it's at least in the top right. It kind of snaps. It's pretty clever at snapping to the edges. If yours is not snapping, just double check view. There's one in here that's called... Smart guides, so grids and guides, smart guides, that's the thing that kind of helps it like automatically just jump to the edge and you don't have to be like perfect, pixel perfect, it'll jump in there for you. So I want it definitely in the top right, I'm gonna grab this bottom left, okay, and I'm gonna hold down my shortcut to resize it. Who remembers what the shortcut was? That's right, Command Shift on a Mac and Command Shift on a PC, so I'm dragging it out. I want it to be at least or bigger than our um, background image. Okay, so when it snapped up in the corner there, and what I want to do is, um, remember if I hold those two shortcut keys down, it resizes it, but if I don't, okay, remember when I grabbed it before, it kind of crops it, and that's going to work in our favor now, because what I want to do is just grab this side, and maybe in the middle, okay, roughly in the middle, okay, I want it to be uh, like this, and same with the bottom, okay, I'm going to drag it up so it's just on my bleed, Okay, I'm cropping bits of the image off, I know. Okay, but that's the kind of look I'm looking for. And what I also might want to do is, remember Content Grabber? I hated it, but it's kind of handy now. Look, I can drag the center of it, and you can see I can drag it within this box a little bit. Okay, so let's bring in one more thing. Let's bring in the logo, exact same technique as the image. So remember, black arrow, click in the background so you've got nothing selected. Go to File, let's go to Place. 
and pick one of the logos. I'm gonna use this first one, logo one full. It doesn't have to be a JPEG or a PNG. It can be an Illustrator file, which is another Adobe product. Let's click open. Okay, and remember in this gray area in the background, click once or you can click and drag to get the size that you want. Okay, and black arrow, grab anywhere but the content grabber. Remember if I try and move them using that center bit, weirdly the image is over here, but the frame is still over here. So I'm gonna undo that. Click off in the background and I'm gonna grab anywhere but the content grabber. Okay, and I'm gonna stick it there somewhere. That's my lovely logo. Earlier I said, you remember you have to have nothing selected. Okay, I'll show you the reason why is if I have this green box selected by accident and I wanna bring in my logo, let's say it's before I brought in this logo. Okay, actually I'll delete it to make it. So I've got this green box selected, file, and I've forgotten to deselect it, go to place and I go, uh, my logo and I click open, it doesn't give me the option of like dragging it out and giving it a size, it just kind of like fuses it with this green th box, which is cool, but it's kind of stuck there now. Okay, there are one in the same. Okay, so I'm gonna undo until life was easier. So remember, before you bring it in, just deselect in the background and then go to file place. All right, my friends, that is working with images. Let's go on and start working with type in InDesign. Hi there, in this video we're gonna look at bringing in type from Word or an email or look at typing it in yourself in InDesign. Okay, and we're just gonna put in a little bit of text here for our little flyer. So you ready? Let's go and do it. Okay, to add text by yourself, grab the type tool, it's this capital T here, and all you need to do is click hold and drag out a box. Now, like we do with the images, if I start kind of dragging over the top of boxes that I've already made, some weird stuff starts happening. So if I click in here, you can see it's kind of fused this box with that box, and it's kind of a bit weird. It's a weird InDesign quirk. Anyway, so what I'm gonna do is have nothing selected. So click in the background, grab my type tool. And what I'm gonna do is click hold and drag a box over here on the side. Okay, if you need more room, see these little sliders. Okay, we can just move across down the bottom here and we can start typing. Okay, no, if you can spell it helps. Okay, but if I start typing over here, obviously I can put in anything I like. I can grab my black arrow to resize the box to the size it needs to be. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is import some text. So I'm gonna use this text box. Okay, I'm gonna use my black arrow and just move it over here. And what I'm gonna do is select all this type, okay, with my type tool, okay, which is the capital T, just delete it all. And I'm gonna import some text. There's two ways of doing it. You could do just caveman style, which works perfectly. Okay, I'm going to jump to Word. Actually, let's open the Word document. So it's part of your exercise files. So find your exercise files. Okay, here's mine on my desktop. I've downloaded it under 01 Flyer. There's one in here called Flyer Text. I'm gonna double click and open it. Okay, I'm gonna copy all this text. So I've selected it all, go to Edit, Copy. If you're on a PC, it's slightly different. There's a Copy button in the corner or Control C. Okay, so whatever you do, select it, copy it, and jump back into InDesign. Okay, and in here, I'm gonna paste it. Okay, you can totally do it that way. Okay, and often that's what I do. You might be copying from an email or from, from anything. Okay, and what you can do though, to be a bit more official and to get a few more options in that copy is I'm gonna delete it all, have my cursor flashing in here, and I'm gonna to go to File, I'm gonna to go to Place. Okay, and I've got some text, okay. So I've found my O1 flyer, there's the flyer text. So it just kind of goes around using Word. Okay, so open and you can see it's dumped it in there. Now the difference between the two is very little in what we're doing, but what you can do and what we'll do later on in my more advanced sections is if we go to file and we go to place, there's an option here that says options and it says show input options. And it means when I bring in my Word document, I get to keep some of the styles that might be in there. Maybe there's a table of contents, that sort of stuff. I'm gonna turn that off and hide that for the moment, but it doesn't really matter how you bring in text as long as we've got some text. Now with my black arrow, I'm gonna drag this box and I'm gonna make the box so it's kind of fits in here appropriately. Okay, within my margins, kind of under the logo here. And what I wanna do is um, I'm gonna use my type tool. Now you notice I don't jump to the type tool, I just kind of double click inside the box and it automatically jumps to the type tool. That's kind of up to you. So I'm gonna select it all and I'm going to do some basic type stuff now. Okay, so if you're happy with formatting type, you might wanna skip along. We're gonna do some of the basics. Okay, so we're gonna pick a font. We're just gonna pick Arial, because I know everyone's got Arial. 
going to be able to spell Arial. I'll use Arial bold for bits of it. Okay, I'm going to select it all again, and along the top here, you've got these two options. Okay, now you might be happy with bold and sizes and stuff, but you'll notice that these two here have very different kind of settings, and we need a lot of them. Okay, so I can see on my, I'm on, it's character and paragraph is the actual names of these. So character has my basic character stuff. Okay, and you can see all the way down here, there's some paragraphs. Of, it's only because my screen is very large. If you've got a smaller laptop, you might not be able to see any of these. So you're going to have to jump to paragraph, and you can see there they are. Okay, so you might have to toggle between these two. So I want to go to the one that says Align Center. Okay, I'm going to highlight this top bit and I'm going to make it my colors over here. I'm going to select the, I'm not gonna use dark green at all. I'm actually just gonna use white, so which is paper over here. Okay, selected tape, Piper. I'm going to go back to character. I'm going to make it all caps. Okay, so I'm gonna capitalize it all. And in terms of the font size, I'm gonna pick a font size. What font size? I don't know. I'm gonna to go to about there. Okay, so 22 point. Okay, go back to my black arrow, click in the background. It's maybe a little bit close to this, so my black arrow come down a little bit. A couple of things I wanna do is I'm gonna select this, make it a little bigger. Okay, and I'm gonna use my green, okay. So I'm gonna use the mid green. This last kind of URL here, I'm gonna select it all, make it, I'm gonna leave it the same size, but I'm gonna use the uh, dark green. All right, black arrow, click out. And that, my friends, is the basics of importing text. You can either just draw a text box, copy and paste it into it, or you can go to File Place, up to you. Um, and we're not gonna go through everything like uh, with this font selected here. I'm not gonna go through what does subscript and tracking. We'll look at some of the more advanced ones a little bit later on, but there are the basics in here and everyone knows what, I don't know, right align is and left align, I hope. If you're not sure on some of them, experiment. We will go through more and more as we get through this course. But for the moment now, we've got our font, we've got our text in, we've got some images. Let's get on to our next video. Hi there, in this video we're gonna look at grouping this thing together and rotating it and adding some text and making a perfect circle and all sorts of fun stuff. So let's go and make him in this video. First up, we'll bring in the text. You could obviously just type it, um, but I'm gonna go to the example files. There's a folder in there called discount text. Open that up. Okay, copy it. And in design, grab the type box and click, hold, drag a box, then hit paste. Okay, remember I'm doing it on the side so that I don't end up messing up these things. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna use this little slide bar, move across a little bit, and what I want to do is I'm gonna select all of this, I'm gonna make it paragraph, I'm gonna make it centered. Okay, I'm gonna use my font that I'm using. Okay, I'm using Arial. Of course you can use anything. Okay, Arial bold. And what size is it gonna be? Oh, I'll have to double check. I've gone for 10 point at the moment, black arrow. Okay, so what we want to do is draw our circle and then group them together. So drawing a circle is click and hold down the rectangle tool, hold, 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 hold on that icon until you get to ellipse, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I could click and drag out any old size, okay? But if I hold down the shift key, okay, on your keyboard, so look at your keyboard, it's on the left and the right often, okay, hold it down, click, hold and drag out, a circle, but while you're holding shift, it makes the circle perfect. That is true of the rectangle tool, it'll make it perfect square. Okay, so how big does it need to be? Oh, first of all, we'll give it a color and a stroke and then we'll go and play with it. So it needs to be our yellow. So at the top here, so I've got it selected. Okay, I've got my black arrow, got it selected at the top here. I'm gonna use my down the bottom here. It's the uh, yellow, okay, green at heart yellow. And in terms of the size, what I want it to be is, I've got it pretty close. Actually, I've got it bang on. If <laughs> I say you want to resize it, what was the shortcut? You remember, of course you remember, it's Command Shift on a Mac, and it's Control Shift on a PC. Grab any of these corners, okay, and you can click and drag it to an appropriate size. Okay, and I'm gonna get it about that size. That looks about good in the corner. I'm gonna move it back off. Okay, now I'm gonna use this type here, stick it over the top, and we're gonna run into our first problem of arranging. Okay, so whoever gets made the last is on top. Our circle was made after the text, so it's on top. So what I'm gonna do is with my black arrow, I'm gonna click off in the background, click on my circle. I'm gonna right click this circle. If you're on a Mac, like a MacBook Pro like me, you might have to use control, okay, and click it. 
that gives you the right click and let's use a range and let's go to send uh, either backwards or back will work okay and now case we want backwards if I send it to the back it'll work it goes behind it but watch what happens when I move it across here it's back behind this image as well okay so what I want to do is I'm gonna undo it I'm gonna right click it and say I want to move it a range and I'm gonna go back wood which means it's gonna go back one step okay and it's gonna go behind this one guy you might have to go back wood a couple of times to get the balance right um, I'm going to grab this does it fit not really so I'm gonna grab this edge here I'm gonna get it so it's on like four lines I'm grabbing the edge here with my black arrow and does that fit kind of now when you are moving things around it can be a little hard because it tries to want to snap okay I've got my keys on my keyboard just the arrow keys you know the cursor keys I'm gonna just tapity tap till I get it right okay and I'm gonna drag this up okay if I want to select these two and align them I'm gonna grab my black arrow Okay, and I'm going to select both of these guys and then up the top here you'll often see it if you can't see it okay there's my little tiny little arrange panel here there's an official panel though if you can't see it it is under window object and layout and you can turn this panel on okay and what it'll let you do is this one here center the both horizontally if yours does what mine just did it's probably not it's aligning to the whole page yours generally by default is aligned to selection so click these guys click this vertical one as well if you want to try and align it that way and um, I'm going to bring you back out here so what I'd like to do is I want to down a little bit I want to group them so I've selected both of them okay by dragging a box brown both and I'm going to go up to object and go to the one that says group all that means is that I can click off and click back on just one of them and I've got them both selected I can select it and go to object and ungroup it as well if I need them apart okay and what I want to do is rotate it remember remember from an earlier video I want you to grab your black arrow and just outside not here just a bit further out we can rotate okay click hold and drag and I'm going to move it down here somewhere that's probably a bit too hard to rotation I'm looking for the cool lean thing like it's a sticker that got stuck on afterwards but clearly it's not all right that is how to group things but we also learned how to make perfect circles and we rotated things again all right let's get on to the uh, next video hi there in this video we're going to look at creating dotted lines and like dashed lines perforation lines we're going to do wavy lines and stripy lines and all sorts of lines so let's go and do that now all right, so to put the border around the outside, we're going to start with the rectangle. So the rectangle tool, not the rectangle frame tool. Okay, the rectangle tool. And what I'd like to do is, you saw earlier that I had it kind of like perfectly away from the edge. Now, um, what I can do is I can draw it exactly the right size. Remember, um, that is actually the edge of the page. This bit on the outside here is the bleed, remember. Okay, so I'm gonna draw it the actual size. Okay, my half letter. Okay, so it's a nice big rectangle. Now we've got a fill of green and a stroke of nothing. So what I would like to do, actually I'll leave it there for the moment just while we're practicing this, because if I grab my selection tool and I try and scale it down proportionately, what are the keys? That's right, Command and Shift on a Mac and Control and Shift on a PC. And if I hold them down, right, and I make them proportionately smaller, okay, you'll notice that if I put it here in the middle, it's actually kind of, uh, uh, it doesn't scale the way we want. We want it equal distances around the outside. So if I scale it down even more, come on. You can see it's a lot bigger on the size than it is in the top and the bottom just because it's scaling that way. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to undo. So it actually fills the outside. And what we can do, you can see at the top here, it's got a width and height. It's perfect. Okay, matches my half letter. But what I can do here is some basic math. Okay, these little boxes, any of these little white boxes, you can do some little math in, which is really handy. So in here, I can go minus, and I'm going to turn up half an inch. Okay, so 0.5. You'll see it just sucked it in half, um, yeah, half an inch. Do the same in here, minus 0.5. You can do times. Okay, if I did times two, Okay, so it'll be times two uh, inches. It's that little asterisk. Okay, and it's a whole lot taller than it needs to be. So I'm gonna undo. Um, so I'm gonna go minus 0.5, minus plus, all that sort of stuff works. And to get it in the middle, you could use your line tools. There's mine at the top here, or there was a panel that we saw earlier, but actually it's just easier to grab your black arrow, 
click hold, and you'll notice that it just kind of snaps. You see those two purple pinky lines just kind of like saying, hey, there's the middle. And you'll see visually it looks like it's in the middle. So it's actually 0.5, half an inch from all the sides, and it looks nice and perfect. So now to make the line dotted. Okay, so we're gonna give it um, no fill. So I clicked on my fill, I'm gonna go to none, and this one here, the stroker on the outside, I'm gonna make it white or paper. Okay, and this is the stroke here, okay, how thick it is. At the moment, it's one point. It's probably what I want, but let's make it nice and big just as an example so we can all see what we're doing. So bump it up to four points. And now we need to find our stroke panel. If you can't find it, mine's there. Hello. Okay, but if you can't find yours, go to window, go down to stroke and turn it on. Now yours might look a little different as well. Yours might be. There's a little fly out menu that says hide options. And if yours looks like mine, you've got really basic control, click on this option and say show options. You get the big ugly version with all the details that we need. Okay, and the one we need the moment is type. Okay, that's gonna allow us to change it from a solid line like we know it to all these other options. There's some weird ones, okay? Ones that I've never used, thick, thin, you might like them. Okay, white diamond, never used. Dotted lines and dashed lines are the ones we're going to look at the moment. And there's two kinds of dotted. Okay, there's dotted and for some reason the Japanese like their dots a little bit closer together. Okay, Japanese thing, not sure. But um, okay, so there's my dots around the outside. If you want a dashed, okay, there's dashed. There's a ugly squirrely line. You might like the squirrely line. Right hash. There's some weird things in there, okay. But we're going to go to dotted and we're going to put the size down, okay, to something... I don't know. I'm putting two points. Um, dash lines. Now you might use dash lines as a visual thing, like I'm doing here. There's nothing. This dotted line's just for, for pretty sake. Okay. What we're gonna do is maybe it's a snip here. You know, the scissors like cut this bit off for the redeem you coupon. Okay. What you can do is instead of doing it for this rectangle, you can do the exact same tricks with just a straight line. Okay. This straight line here, I can draw. Okay, and what I might do actually is draw it straight up and down. If you want to draw a line straight up and down, it's the similar technique we did when we made a uh, sorry a circle. Remember, we held down shift and it was a perfect circle. That same technique makes it a perfect line. So if I hold down shift before I start dragging it out, you can see it kind of really wants to go up, straight up and down. So say that's going to be my perforation line where I want people to snip it off. It's got a fill. A line can't have a fill. Okay, and the line around the outside is going to be white. Okay, I'm going to make it two points just so you can see it. And then you can see the exact same controls. Hey, somebody's calling. Okay, let's go to dash lines. Mm, dashed. All right. Uh, I'm going to pause there. Go check the phone. I'll be right back. All right, so I'm back. And the dotted line here, okay, this dash line, sorry, I don't need it. So I've selected it with my black arrow and just hit delete on my keyboard. Just tap the key on your keyboard and it's gone. All right, dash lines, dotted lines, wavy lines, curly lines, all of that. Okay, let's move on to our next video. Okay, so while we've been working, we've been just ignoring these like blue lines and this little linking icon and there's lots of blue lines around the edges of the boxes and that can be a real pain when you're trying to line things up. Okay, it just doesn't look very nice. So the quick and easy way to preview and turn all that off is the W key. Just the W key on your keyboard next to Q in between E. Okay, um, but for that to work, you need to be on the black arrow. Okay, if you're in the type tool, you're just gonna type a W. Okay, so be on the black arrow, hit W on your keyboard. Ah, oh, look at that, blue line's gone. You get to feel a bit of the space around it. You can still work in this view. You can see I can click on it, drag it around, okay? And there's nothing stopping you work like this, except sometimes it is easier to see all the blue lines. The other thing that might throw you off if you try and work in this view, okay, so I'm gonna hit W to go back out. Watch this, if I start typing something and I go, okay, remember we type on the outside to not join them up and we start typing, um, Okay, and watch this, if I go to my black arrow and deselect off, hit W, ah, it's gone. Okay, it's still there. Okay, just W kind of hides all of that stuff. So that can be one of the things to note. If anything starts uh, disappearing in this gray area, it's probably just because you've got to tap W again. And the other thing it does is, I'm going to delete that, is you see the bleed? Okay, I'll zoom in. Okay, there we go. If I hit W, can you see the bleed gets trimmed off? To give you a more of a view of like, say this border, because it's going to get trimmed off in the bin, remember? So it cuts that off. Um, so yeah, I tap W all the time. The problem with W is I forget when I'm in the type tool and I type a W and I won't notice and somebody will be proof checking my work and they'll be like, what's a home we? And I'll pretend like I don't know. Somebody else did it. I know it's because I tap the W key. 
and I was on the type tool. Bad Dan. The other thing we're going to check is uh, the display. So mine is set by default to high quality display. I think that's a fact of the new bits of software, okay, the new installs of InDesign. If you're using an older one, okay, we're going to look at this. So I've got nothing selected. Go up to View. There's one called Display Performance. Okay, so often, especially the earlier versions, I'm not sure if it's the new version or not. I'm not sure if it's settings that I've got or whether um, it's remembered from my last install or whether it's actually by default now. But let's just double check. Typical display is what it used to be set as and yours might be. The problem is, is that things just look a little bit gross. You can see the logo here just doesn't look very nice. You know it's good quality because you've seen it in a different program, but it's not looking good in here. The reason it's uh, often the default for typical quality is because uh, trying to run fast. InDesign is trying to run quickly, so it's not pr producing these beautiful outlined logos, okay, and it's the same with images. So yeah, it's, it's typical by default. So what we can do, nothing selected, view and crank yours up to high quality. I work in high quality all the time, even with an 80 page document. Why? Because my machine can handle it. If you're, I've got a pretty new MacBook Pro. Um, if you're working on a really old cruddy laptop, hand me, hand me downs, you might find actually it's just can't keep up. So you might manually go in and say, actually, I'm just going to look at everything typical quality because maybe you're doing type amends and it just takes so long to scroll through all the pages. Okay, so you can switch it to typical quality. If you're running Windows XP on a really old laptop that barely starts up, okay, what you might do is you might go to view and there's another one on there that says fast display. Okay, what this will do is allow you to do text amends super duper fast, okay? These aren't gone. If you produce a PDF now or print it, they print fine. They're just kind of placeholders to make the system run really fast. So if you are finding, man, this is jumpy and slow, switch to fast, okay, and you can toggle between if you're working with the images. One last thing about previewing, okay, so let's say I'm going to present to somebody, say a colleague or my boss or a client, I'm going to show them my design. Okay, instead of showing them this ugly version with the blue lines and all my swatches around here, okay, uh, what I want to do is present to them. Okay, so I could make a PDF and make a presentation, that sort of stuff. But it's actually easy to do straight from InDesign down the bottom here of your toolbar, it's right down the bottom. Okay, this last one, if I click and hold normal, Okay, preview is the one we've been toggling between when we hit W, which if I, this is the long way, if I click on preview, that is the exact same as hitting W. Okay, so we don't want that one, but this one here, we never use, well, we never use, bleed and slug will show you like a preview, but include the slug, uh, a bleed and slug, hey ho, I never use these, I use this one down the bottom here, presentation, does this, it's quite cool, it shows you know, gets rid of all the junk and just presents it nicely, kind of like a PowerPoint presentation. And if you've got multiple pages, you can use your keyboard. I only have one page, but you can use your arrow key on your keyboard and work through all your different pages like PowerPoint. And you can actually add transitions between them all. Um, we'll do that in the more advanced InDesign course, but yeah, anyway. So um, how did I get out of that? In it, hit escape to get back. And we are back to the ugly blue line version. W, pretty. All right, that's it for this one. Let's go and make a PDF version in the next video. I'll see you there. Hi there. In this video, we're going to look at creating a PDF from InDesign. We're going to make this super complicated one for the printers. It's not that hard. And this one here, just a pretty little version that we can email out or send to our local printer. Okay, and share and do all that awesome PDF stuff. All right, let's go and do that now. All right, so first thing to do is save your document, file, save. Next thing to do is, if it's grayed out, okay, it just means you have already saved. Doesn't mean you can't save, it means you've already done that. Don't do it again, okay? So the next thing we wanna do is we wanna go down to export, okay? Or Command D on a Mac or Control E on a PC, export. Super easy, down the bottom here, it should probably default to, um, to Adobe PDF. We're gonna use this one called print. Okay, you use that one if you're going out to obviously print. Okay, and make sure it's set to that. Give it a name. Okay, I'm going to call mine a name and put it into our folder um, on my desktop, InDesign class files. This one's going to be called my Green at Hearts Flyer and my V1. Okay, and hit save. Now, the cool thing about this is this can look quite complicated and you can make it complicated if you want. Okay, but let's just do the basics now and we'll go through some more advanced exporting later on in the course. Okay, so check out that video. But for the moment, go up to here, put it on high quality print. Okay, and then just hit export. That's it. 
Okay, this will give you a print, uh, a PDF that will go to a printer and print perfectly. It'll print from your office. It'll be downloadable and look good quality. It'll do all of those things. Okay, so let's just do a tiny little bit more with a PDF. Okay, so I'm going to jump back. Mine's automatically opened up in Acrobat. Yours might not, so you might have to go and find it. Mine's on my desktop in that folder we made, and there it is there. Okay, you might have to double click it. And yours is going to open up in some program. Okay. So what I'd like to do is a couple of other things. So let's have a little look in InDesign, so a little bit more detail. So file export again. I'm going to give it the same name and override it. It won't let me save it over the top because I've got it open in this program. So I'm going to have to close it down in Acrobat. Okay. I'm going to give it the same name. It's going to say, would you like to replace? If it says you can't replace because it's open somewhere, go and close it. Okay. So I'm going to replace it. High quality print, set it to that, it's fine. The other thing you might do is go to smallest file size. Okay, it's going to make it a lot smaller in terms of file size. So this might be better if you are, it's a really long document. Say it's, say it is an 80 page uh, prospectus, okay, with lots of images. You might go to small file size because you're sending it out to, I don't know, colleagues to do a check. Not the final print, just some, you know, so it's not so big and you can email it. Okay, so, but let's, so that's, that's all you need to do for that. Let's say we want to go to high quality print, but we're sending it to our commercial printer. Okay, there's, uh, there's like two little things we're going to do is this one under marks and bleeds. If you, we've added bleed to ours, remember? Okay, it was three millimeters or um, quarter of an inch. I can't remember, 0.125. And in here, we're gonna turn on crop marks. Okay, so crop marks is the only thing you'll need. And down here where it says, so I said two things, crop marks, and you turn on the bleeds. Okay, it's picked, it's remembered our bleed. Okay, you can manually type it in here. Okay, but if I say use the bleeds from the document, you can see it in there, very faded out, but 0.125. Okay, and I'm going to click export. And the only difference is, can you see around the outside here? Okay, these little crop marks here are used by the printer to slice. Okay, so they use, they line a guillotine up with that one and that side, and they just trim it off, and that chunk in this little gap goes in the bin. Okay, so if you're sending it to a commercial printer to print, you've got bleed, and you want to... Um, add the bleed, okay? So all you do is you turn on the crop marks under export and you turn on your bleed settings. If you're just sending it out to be printed internally, okay, or if you download it from a website, you don't have to turn those crop and bleed marks on. Now, before we finish up, let's just have a quick look at our export settings. Is one of the things, I just wanna show you this one. So uh, I'm gonna close down this guy. Okay, I'm gonna give it the same name, replace. I'm gonna say yes, please. And we're gonna look at these. So we're gonna turn all of these on. There you go, turn them all on. Why would we turn them all on? You'd never turn them all on, okay? We do it to impress people. Look at that. Look how impressive and designery we look with all these extra marks, these color bars, these registration marks. It all looks very good. The time is actually something you might turn on, okay? And it has the document name. If I was sending this to a commercial printer, they would only want the crop marks. They would add their own color bars. These are just here to help the printer on their side of things. They've got a master color chart and they'll put it, they'll print yours out and they'll put their master chart next to these colors and just to see that they all kind of match. Okay, and that will mean that their printer is working well, but they wouldn't expect you to put them on. You wouldn't add registration marks either. These are used by the printer. What they do is that registration color is actually printed in, it looks black, but it's actually cyan, magenta, yellow, and black all together. And what happens is if it goes through the printer and the paper jiggles a little bit, what happens is if they see a yellow target kind of sticking at the side here, they'll know that the plates aren't lined up or at least the printing ink is not laying over the top. Okay, and it might be, the, the image might be a little fuzzy because these things aren't printing exactly on top of each other. Okay, but that only happens when you get to offset printing. So we turn it on mainly to impress people. Say you're a designer and you're sending it off to the client. This kind of stuff I feel like is like, yeah, I'm a proper designer with all these things. Okay, but if you're sending it to the printer, pull them all off. Okay, so I've got away on a bit of a tangent there. So just to recap, if you don't have bleed and you don't need it, so it's gonna be just email to somebody or download it from website, file export, Click, give it a name, replace, yes please, and just pick high quality print and then hit export. Okay, if you need the bleed, all you need to do extra is turn on the marks, go to crop marks and turn on the document bleed and then hit export. Okay, what you'll notice is see modified along the top here, it just means that if I pick high quality print, that's all basic, but if I turn this on, you see it becomes modified, you've changed it a little bit. Okay, it doesn't matter if it says modified because you've added these, we know what we're doing, we are professionals. All right, that long-winded explanation of PDFs is now over.
We'll go into some super advanced nerdy stuff in the advanced course of InDesign if you ever need to get into there. But really what we've got here will work for 99% of the jobs you're going to work on. All right, see you in the next video. Okay, so we need to save a JPEG out ready for some purpose. You might be sticking it into a PowerPoint presentation or a Word document or sending it to a website to be used as part of a WordPress CMS, something. Okay, you need a JPEG or a PNG, same principle works. The one thing I'd say is that often a PDF will work as well. Okay, if I'm putting it into Word or PowerPoint, a PDF will go in. The nice thing about PDFs is that the quality is always a lot better, especially for type. Okay, but if you have to use a JPEG, let's do it this way. Let's go to File, Export, same as a PDF. And down the bottom here, where it used to say um, Adobe PDF, go down to either JPEG or PNG. Super easy. Okay, and I'm going to give it the same name, but I'm going to make a high res version, high resolution, high quality one. You can call it what you like. Hit save. I'm saving it into that folder on my desktop. All pages, I'm going to do pages. We haven't done any spreads yet. We'll look at that later. And then the quality. Okay, and you've got two things that kind of really control what it looks like quality and the resolution. Quality will be how pixelated it is, okay? How, like, what the, is it a bit scrappy and a bit yucky looking? And medium will still look fine. Low will look gross, never use low. But medium will be fine. High will be um, pretty amazing. And maximum, you won't see the difference between these two, I promise. Okay, so we're going to go for a high-res one. Maximum. Okay, so it's going to look as good as it can be, but the file size is going to be quite big. And then resolution here, the lowest is 72, and the highest you want to go to is 300. Anything past this, this thing is going to be absolutely big, like meters wide. So we're going to go 300. Um, color space is RGB. Okay, always going to be RGB for a JPEG. And leave this stuff at the bottom. Let's click export. Nothing really happens. You've got to go and find that folder, and there's my high res. He's 1.4 megabytes. It's pretty big. Okay, but you look at the quality. Pretty awesome. Okay, beautiful. So let's do the version. Let's say I'm sending it out and it's going to go up onto a website. And I know that 1.4 megabytes is far too big for our website. So, or emailing even, it's pretty big. So, we're going to go to export and we're going to say make something really small. Okay, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it low res. Okay, and I'm going to go through and say maximum. I'm going to put it down to like high. Uh, no, let's do medium. Okay, and uh, this is the kind of lowest you ever want to go 72 at medium. Click export. And you'll notice that the high res version, I'll make this a little bigger. I'll even make it a little bigger. Okay, so 1.4 is the high res and see this one here, kilobytes. So that is 0 0.04 instead of 1.4. So it's tiny compared to it. And look at the quality. It's smaller, the quality is fine. It's not gonna win the quality awards, but this one here is really big, but really big file size. So probably somewhere in the middle, right? Just find yours, go to 150 DPI and go to maximum, see what the size is. Another thing you might find is that if you don't have any images, okay, say it's just block colors, your file size is gonna be a lot smaller because it doesn't have to deal with all of these colors. If you've got hundreds of images, it's gonna be even bigger than 1.4. Cool, so that my friends is how to save a JPEG from InDesign. Let's get on to the next video. Okay, in this video, we're gonna look at CC libraries. I love them. You've been probably avoiding them for a long time. They're amazing. Let's get to use them because we're gonna add things like this, logos and images and colors, and it's gonna mean we can use them in other InDesign documents, but also look, they appear the same in Photoshop and Illustrator and After Effects and all the other lovely Adobe products. Let's go and learn how to use them. Okay, so first thing we need to do is make sure you can see your CC libraries. It's under Window, CC Libraries. Let's make a new library. I'm going to keep this one that I've got, but if you've skipped the early tutorial we did when we made our colors, you'll have to go to this little drop down. It's probably going to say my library. It's the one you get by default. Down the bottom here, it says create new library. Okay, create it, give it a name. I've called mine Graded Heart for this client that I'm working for. Now, let's say we've added these colors earlier, but let's say you skip that. Let's say that, or maybe there's just a new color that's appeared. Okay, so what you do is I've drawn a rectangle and it's filled with some random color that I now want to include in part as my swatches. The way to do it is have it selected with the black arrow, okay? And what we can do is see this little plus sign at the bottom here? Okay, so I'm in my green at heart library, I wanna add something to it, and you can see here is a graphic and fill color. Graphics are actually gonna add the square itself. I don't need that square, I just need the fill color. 
Okay, so click add for just that fill color. If I have them both selected, let me show you. If I add the graphic as well, I get a rectangle. That's cool, it means that later on I can drag out that exact same rectangle and use it over and over again. That might be useful for you. I don't want him, so I can click on him, hit the little trash can, bye-bye. But two of these colors now, goodbye. It's got an ugly color that I don't want, goodbye. So that's how to add colors, other things you can add. Okay, and probably the most useful is images. There's this image here, and I'm gonna add it so that I can use it in lots of other documents, because this library stays there, it doesn't matter what document you have open. If I go to a new document, file new, new document, click create, you can see these are still here, allowing me to just quickly grab out colors and stuff. So. Uh, let's go back to this one. Now adding images can be interesting. If it's just the image by itself, you can just click, hold and drag it in. Okay, but you can see I've dragged it because I've already cropped it and you can see it's dragged a cropped version of it. It's, the image is actually quite big. Okay, so what you can do is double click the image. You can kind of start to see it spread out for this red edge here. Okay, and that means I've got the whole image selected. And down here, actually now can I drag it? I can. So I have just dragged it by double clicking it and you can see that's the entire image. So I'm gonna don't want this guy. Okay, this is my, I don't know, food image. Okay, so you can add images that way. Other things you might add, say this logo here, I can select it. And because it's not cropped, I can just drag the whole thing in there. Okay, and that's my logo green. You can add blocks of type. Okay, so like this one here, say this little round all thing I've made, I wanna use over and over again. It's something like it's our, I don't know, a call to action or our unique selling point, okay? Um, I'm gonna click and hold and drag it. You can see the whole unit comes with me. So if I go to this next document and I go, I wanna quickly build a thing. I can drag out an A4 page. I can go up the top here, okay? And I can click on filling it with the green, actually dark green, drag the logo out. I can add my image and this little round all thing. You can see how quickly you can start building extra documents because you've got everything in this library. It gets even better, okay, if you jump out to another Adobe product. So I jump into, say, uh, Photoshop. Okay, I'm working on this and say I need that color or you can see this is another library that I'm working on. But if I switch to this one here, where is he? Mm, green at heart. You can see he's in this one as well. So I can use them across all these documents. Here you go. I'm not sure why this drawing that I've done needs round walls and stuff, but you get the point, point right. You can go between um, any Adobe product. So I use this a lot between say my video work in After Effects and Premiere or my graphic design work out of Photoshop and Illustrator. They all use the same libraries. One last thing to consider is that say you are a freelancer or you're beginning a freelancing role or it means that when you sign into another computer and you use your Adobe ID, these libraries will pre-populate. So if I go into an office and they say, Dan, I want you to do some work with us and you're gonna use our machine. So I jump on their machine and even if they don't have a license for it, I can download the trial and log in with my username and ID. Okay, you can have it installed on more than one computer. When it opens up, the trial version becomes a full version because I'm a paying customer and all my libraries pre-populate with the stuff that I use. Okay, so that can be really handy when you're switching machines. It all syncs up and it also does cool things with some of the Adobe apps. Go check out the App Store. There are some cool things that libraries work with them too. Okay, so libraries are awesome. You've probably seen them in lots of the Adobe products and ignored them. Start using them because they are wicked. Okay, wicked's not the word. I take that back. They are awesome or great, not wicked. All right, terrible ending over. Next video, please. Hi there, in this video we're gonna make a nice little zip file that we can send to people and inside that zip file we have the InDesign file plus all the links and fonts and images all ready to go so I can send it off to my colleagues so they can start working on the file or it might be that I'm sending it to myself to my home computer to start working on it or I might just be packaging it all up to archive it and take it off my machine so that I can get on to the next job. Let's look at this packaging InDesign files ready for other people in this video. Okay, so to share our InDesign file, we need to use the package feature. Okay, so let's go to file and go to package. Make sure it's saved first. Okay, and leave all of this, click package. Ignore printing instructions. Okay, nobody uses this. It's meant to be for notes that you gave to your printer. Contact me if the printer's ready. Okay, but you'll be doing that via email. Not sure anybody uses that. Okay, create package folder. So this is gonna be an actual folder that's gonna group everything and stick it in. So I'm gonna put mine on my desktop in my InDesign class files. The name of it, I'm gonna give mine a different name. I'm gonna call mine uh, 
uh, green at heart flyer and call this one packaged document packaged files that's better okay and we're gonna leave all of these ticked and we'll look at them all when we're finished let's click package it says do not share fonts it's illegal okay but we need to share the fonts because we paid for them so we ignore that it's a gray area so let's jump to our desktop and you can see there is my class folder and there's that folder that's been made the package file so let's see what's in here okay let's go inside and there's a bunch the indesign file is the main thing that is the bit where i'm going to send it off to uh one of my colleagues and they're going to start working on it they're going to double click the indd file the indesign file and that's what's going to open it up and they're going to uh, be able to start working on it okay um a pdf there is just for a visual it's just to kind of give people yeah i like a little quick visual without having to open up the indesign file to see what it is you don't technically need that it's just helpful same with this file here the idml file is just helpful saying you're sending it to jeff and jeff is going to try and open it but he's using a super old version of indesign it means that he might try and open the indd and it just comes up with lots of errors saying no way jose uh you my version's too old or too new okay he can open up that version okay and will there be any problems probably not if it's a simple document if you're doing some hardcore uh, animated interactiveness then maybe but we're not at the moment so it should all work out fine okay the important things are these font folders and links these are really important the instructions we kind of ignored that so i'm going to delete it we didn't write anything in there it's meant to be printer instructions okay tell them what to do how to contact you um so fonts you can see here there was that remember that warning that said hey are you sure you can share these fonts be careful check your licenses and you should Okay, but this is how to get people a document and the fonts that are used in it. So it doesn't come up with font errors. Okay, so we'll send those to them. And the links, okay, and the links are just considered, you can see here's the logo and this uh, graphic that I've used in there. So all of these are super important. Okay, so if I just send them the InDesign file, it doesn't have, uh, it's going to open, but it's going to say, hey, alert, I'm missing the fonts. Hey, alert, I'm missing all the images. So you want to send all of this. So what you tend to do is there's that folder that got packaged. Okay, we were just inside there a second ago. Is you right click it. And if you're on a Mac, you go to compress. And if you're on a PC, I think there's a send to zip file. You might have to little look through your options. You're looking for a zip or compress folder. Okay, click this and see this little zip folder that can be emailed. Okay, so you can't email a folder, weirdly. Okay, but you can email the zip folder or it might be just backup. Okay, you're working in an agency and you're trying to keep everything, you're closing it off and you want it off your computer, but you know that the images are all over the place. You just want this tidy little package that you can archive and say, job done, delete off my computer. Is you package it up into a folder, send this one. All right, my friends, that is how to package a document and send it to people without having lots and lots of problems. Okay, so now it's homework time. Well, not homework, it is class exercise time, and I'd love for you to go through and do this. Now, when I'm running my in-classroom training, okay, this I find this is the most valuable part of the whole experience. Instead of following me step by step, you'll run into problems and be able to fix them yourself. Now, like I do in my classroom training, I've got a checklist. I'd like you to do all of these things, please. So set aside some little bit of time now, okay, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, it might take you an hour, depending on how fast you're picking it up. But nicely, you get to do this at home at your own pace. So go through and do every single thing on this list, and when you're finished, you can use this thing in your portfolio. You have permission, okay? You can use this in your portfolio to say, this is something that I've made, and it is. What I'd also like you to do is send me a copy, okay? You might follow this verbatim, and that's totally fine. I just wanna see that you've done it send it to me okay depending on where you're watching this videos often there's a comments or a class exercise part so stick it in there either the pdf or the jpeg version or even a screenshot okay and just work you through those lists so let me quickly help you with what you need to do it's a new document easy but in that new document it needs to be a us half letter or a5 depending on which part of the world you're in it needs to be a bleed of three millimeters or an eighth of an inch depending on what part of the world you're from Okay, facing pages is gonna be turned off. We're gonna make it landscape. I want you to create your very own new library for this client here called Green Gardener, call it that. Add the brand colors. You'll see that in your exercise files, 
There they are there. Okay, there is something called, so an O1 flyer, there's one called class exercise. And in here are your colors. There's the colors there. Okay, there's the checklist that I'm reading through now as well. You can, you can read through it on your own time if you don't want to pause this video. Um, and here's some other bits. This is the finished file that you can kind of see in the background here. So you can use that as an example if you get lost. Okay, and other things you need to do, add those brand colors, okay, and add them to your CC library. You need to use a logo that's in there and one of the images. There's three to pick from. Um, you can use your own, that's totally fine. You can use your own logo, your own colors. I'd love you to do that, okay? But if you just wanna kind of charge on and finish them, okay, you can just use the example stuff. Your image needs to be cropped like this one, okay? It's a lot bigger and we've cropped it down using our special tricks. I want you to make the heading up a case. I would like you to put a dashboard. We used a dotted one earlier on. Create a round all. Round all is the kind of name of this, like this little round thing with some text in it. Okay, so I want you to create this with a perfect circle. I want you to group these two together. I want you to rotate them round. Then I'd like you to save and name your file, maybe using the V1. And I'd like you to create a PDF with crop marks. Okay, and then send me a version of it. I'd love to see it. Now, if you get stuck with anything, please drop me a comment or go back through the previous videos. The previous videos will cover everything we've done in here. If you do get lost, though, and you're not too sure, drop me a message and I'll give you a hand. Now, I promise you, I've been teaching InDesign for about 12 years now, and it's the people that actually take the effort and do these like little extra examples are the ones that pick it up the most. Following me step by step is awesome until you run into problems. So go ahead, do this one, send me a screenshot, send me a sample. Even if you don't, just keep it on your side, keep it for your portfolio, but make sure you do it. All right, let's go on to the next project. Exciting. <music>Okay, so when you are getting started with InDesign, you might also be getting started in design in general. So getting ideas for layouts can be quite tough. So inspiration is how you'll grow really quickly is look at the best people around, see what they're doing. We're not copying here, we're getting inspired by and we're appropriating their ideas and using our own content, our own fonts, our own colors. Yeah, so just inspiration. So the places to go, Pinterest is an easy one. It's the one in here in front of me. I put in magazine spread. Spread is two pages side by side and gives you an idea of, you know, just kind of ideas and might get started. You can, once you've signed in, you can start pinning them to your own boards and you'll have a kind of a collection of things you like. Like. Okay, I like another version. It's very similar to Pinterest. It's called Nice. Okay, with two eyes. There it is. There. Co. Um, I like this one. It's just a, I find a better layout. So I've done the same thing. I've done a search for magazine spread. It just removes all the Pinterest kind of branding from it. I like this site. Just like Pinterest, you can have boards here. And when you get them all together, let's have a look at one of my boards. Hand drawn type. Okay. You can see here, you can start kind of gathering ideas to get your job going. Another really good one is Behance. Behance has some other perks other than just inspiration. I've done magazine spread in here. This is the place that we're gonna look at later in the tutorial for your portfolio. Okay, this is where people get found as designers more and more. Another perk in here is often they'll have, like see this one here, it's not somebody's work so much as it's a photorealistic catalog magazine, you can download and start using it, okay, like a little template. Now one of the problems often is you'll see this and you'll say, great, here's a really cool cover, I really like it, but you have a different project. Somebody's come to you and said, hey, here's the cover, and they haven't said here's like three words to put on it, they've said, hey, I want you to fill the cover with two pages of Word documents, and you're like, eh. You don't get to do lovely negative space and big blank areas because you've got to fill it jam-packed. I find the best inspiration for those kind of text-heavy annual reports, uh, brochures, kind of really text-heavy stuff is to Google annual report. So I'm in Google here. I've typed annual report. Just add the word PDF. Publicly listed companies have to go and report their annual reports online. So you will find lots of stuff. And I've just clicked on a few of these and found like... I don't even know what CRH is. I'm just kind of looking at how they're getting around because you see there's a lot of data they have to communicate. They've done some really cool infographics. Okay, they've gone for a three column layout, one, two, three. Okay, so I'm just looking for it for inspiration, just thinking like, mm, I never considered the big type down the side, big image. Okay, so getting ideas from this. His BMW's one. You can see somebody's going to hand you a thing like this, and you're like, how am I going to show this Excel graph and actually make it legible? You can see here they've done a really nice job of kind of clarifying the year that we're at. And yeah, you just work through some of these really text-heavy documents and get an idea about how you might approach it. 
Another thing you can do is use a starter template. So in design especially, okay, if you go to new or file new, um, you go to print and let's say we're doing uh, some sort of brochure or a magazine, you'll see underneath these blank documents now we have these templates. Okay, if you're using an older version of InDesign, it doesn't work. Okay, but here we've got some templates and let's say we are doing some sort of, you can see there's a jacket, there's a food magazine layout. Let's click on this and let's click on show preview and it just gives you an idea you're like hmm i like this and you might start with this and you can totally use this and just switch out the images there's nothing stopping you but what you'll find is you'll end up adjusting it to suit your tastes and your content and it will change quite a bit and you'll be able to kind of take ownership of the design and all you do is click download okay you've got to be connected to the net it takes a little while but eventually the only difference is that these images won't be there when you open it you can see now it's downloaded oh there it is there done click open it's using fonts we don't currently have. We're gonna look at missing fonts a little bit later on, but we're just gonna click sync fonts and hit close. Okay, and you've got a magazine layout. The only trouble is without the images, it just doesn't look as pretty, does it? But hopefully you've got access to some images for your work. Okay, otherwise you're gonna to have to go to stock library sites and start filling it in. It's a nice way to get started. Now my parting advice for somebody who's a little stressed out for getting design ideas is that it does get easier. Nobody's born a good designer, but now you've got an interest and you've got some tools in this area, you'll start keeping an eye out for designs that you like, fonts that you like, colors you start liking. And what will happen after a few projects, you'll start knowing what clients like and what they don't like and what's worked and what hasn't. And as you get more experienced, you'll start to be able to pull designs out of thin air, but you're not pulling them out of thin air. You're pulling out of past experiences, successes, wins, losses. So that's gonna be it for our inspiration section. We're gonna go through onto the next section where we start updating somebody else's file. Very important. <laughs> Hi there, in this video we're going to work with a file that's been sent to us by somebody else and we're going to have some issues with the images not being loaded and in the next video we'll look at with the fonts not being loaded. So first of all, let's go and go to file, let's go to open and download the exercise files and in there is a file called O2 existing work. Open that up and there's green at heart prospectus. Open them up and warning, we're missing some images. It might say modified. Okay, let's click okay. It also might say we're missing fonts and we'll do that in the next video. But basically this is what we've got. Okay, we had a document, but these images are missing. The weird thing is, is that I can see them. They're right there. Okay, why can't I use those? Is it that they print really badly? They look okay on screen, but they print really badly. So we need to link them back up. Now this highlights one of the differences between InDesign and Word. Word, when you put an image inside of it, it kind of just packages it into the docx file. Okay, when you send it to somebody, it comes along with it. With InDesign by default, it likes to link to the images. Why do we do that? It's because the InDesign can run super duper fast when it's only linking to it. Whereas Word, if you've worked with a really big Word document with lots of images, you'll notice it runs really slowly. So that's the difference. So when somebody sends you an InDesign file, be expecting the images to be along with it separately, often in a zip file. Okay, If you just get the InDesign file and no images, you're kind of stuck. Okay, so you need to find those images. They might send them later or they might just be hiding somewhere on your computer or the network drive at work, something like that. So we just need to relink them. So let's do that. Over here, okay, you can see my links panel. If you can't see it, go to window and go to links. These are the images that are contained in my file. Now these ones have got the big red question mark. That means they are completely missing. So we're gonna relink them. Yours might just say modified. It might have a yellow caution symbol here. Often you can just click on them and hit this one here which says update and often there'll be no difference okay you click on it and the image will reload but nothing will change often that's just a quirk between mac and pcs sometimes it's to do with the time zones often there's nothing different keep an eye on it just to check but often there's no change my case though missing this completely so i'm going to try and find this green logo one i'm going to select it and down here there's this little chain icon called relink click on him and what I've done in your exercise files is go back to the parent folder, okay? And in here, there's one called missing footage. I'm not sure why I call it footage. Okay, it should be missing images. And in here, okay, there it is, green logo one. I'm gonna click open, okay? And it's gone and replaced it. Now you can select more than one. So I've selected the first one, hold it, shift, click the second one, go to relink. And it's looking for this first one here called tabletop. Okay, so I'm gonna call this one tabletop, click open. And then I'm gonna click this one, it says black. Nice, okay, so they're all relinked, they're ready to go, they're not missing anymore. 
What you might find is this word content here is pink and looks kind of strange. It's because you're missing the font. So let's go into the next video and look at missing fonts and fixing those. Hi, in this video, we're going to look at what happens when you open up somebody else's document and it says, dun dun, you're missing fonts. There's missing images as well, but we do that in an earlier video. I'm going to close this down. Okay, and you'll also notice that it goes this horrible pink color for anything that is missing. So let's go and do that in our tutorial. Okay, so in this video, we've been sent a file by somebody, but the fonts have come up missing fonts. So if you're following along with the exercise files, open up O2 existing work, open up green at heart prospectus, and it says missing links, which we did in a previous video, so go check that one out. But now we're going to deal with this one, missing fonts. Now, this can be a super easy fix, or this can be super complicated. Super easy means it's a font that actually exists on Adobe's Typekit. Typekit is the name that Adobe calls its font library. And what can happen is it can load up and it senses you don't have that font in your machine, but it says, hey, I found Roboto Slab Lite on Typekit, and because you're a Creative Cloud member and awesome, would you like me to download it and install it for you? Okay, and you can click sync fonts and life is good. Where life is harder, it's when it has no syncing here and it says I cannot find it anywhere. So what you need to do is you need to click on this find fonts. Okay, and it's gonna tell you, in our case, it's Roboto Slab Lite that's missing. Okay, and what we can do, I can click sync fonts here, because it's on Typekit, but you might not have that option. Often it's not. So what you need to do is do one of two things. You can replace it with something else, okay? Because sometimes if you're working across Mac and PC, say somebody's used Times New Roman. Times New Roman is what a PC calls Times New Roman. A Mac, for some reason, calls it Times, okay? Same font, same attributes. So you might have to go and say, actually, Roboto Slab, I'm going to go into my list. Okay, this is the list that are on my computer and find it. And it might just have, it might be the pro version. So you might have, you might have Roboto Pro or something slightly different. Okay, and you can go and replace it and you keep an eye on it and see if the font changes and it might be exactly the same. Or you might have to go through and say, I don't have a Roboto Slab, so I'm just going to use Arial. Okay, and I'm going to hit change all. Okay, and it's going to go through and switch out every use of Roboto for Arial. And that's a sad day because Roboto Slab is nice and Arial is not nice. Another thing you could do is actually just ignore this. Hit done, don't care about it, and it's gonna go this big kind of pink color. I know where it is there. Okay, so I've got W on, off, okay, and it goes this kind of horrible pink outline color. Say I'm just doing a text check. Okay, I've sent it to somebody and they're just doing a quick check of the text. They're missing the fonts, don't worry about it. Just leave it missing, send it back to the person who originally owned it, who does have the font, and it will come back to life. If that's still not fixing your problems, you're going to have to install the font. You'll get a package document from your designer or whoever made this. Okay, it'll be a zip file and inside of it will be, let's have a look at an existing one I've got. Let's have a look at our desktop and design class files. We made this package file earlier. Okay, so somebody might have sent you this and inside of here is a documents font. And you might find, hey, there he is there. And all you need to do is double click it. And depending on what program you're on, I'm on a Mac. Okay, and I can just click install font. Okay, if you're on a PC, it's a very similar process. What I've done for this class is in your exercise files under missing footage, there's one called Roboto Slab, and here are all the fonts that we need. In this case, it's Roboto Slab Lite. If I go and install this one now, life should be okay. Go back in here, ha, sprung to life. If you don't have that font and it hasn't been sent to you, you're gonna have to probably buy it. Some fonts are free, lots of them aren't. If you're gonna go and buy it, I can recommend myfonts.com. This is where I buy my fonts. Fonts aren't cheap, or it depends. People put a lot of work into these fonts. So say that I need a font and I need to buy this, uh, this vintage one that's been made. You can see here, this one here is gonna cost me 27 euros. Okay, bigger fonts. By that I mean it has a whole lot more characters and weights than you're gonna pay more. Okay, but this is a good place to go buy it. But there are plenty of other places, pick whichever one works for you. Okay, so I hope one of those options helps you with finding a missing font. Let's get on with this tutorial series. Right, in this image we're going to look at switching out images. So we're going to switch this one with this one. Let's go do that. Okay, so obviously updating somebody's text is super easy. Grab the type tool, select it change it to the date. Okay, selecting images, 
just as easy. I'm going to click on this image here. It doesn't really matter actually. If I click on it, it highlights it over here. I can have nothing selected and selected here. I know that that's the image. Gardening Tools 1, but let's say I'm replacing it. I need a new cover. I could delete this and bring in another file and try and stretch it around. But what we're going to do is something a little bit easier. I'm going to undo that. So with it selected, I'm going to relink. And instead of what we did earlier, which was relinking to like a missing file, I'm going to go into our exercise files, go into existing work, and there's replacement image. Okay, I'm going to go switch it out. Now what we're going to do is we're going to grab our content grabber, kind of move it around to reposition it how we want. Okay, I might have to zoom out. Often that is helpful when you are repositioning images in the different sizes. So I'm going to hit Command minus to zoom out. You might hit Control minus if you're on a PC. Okay, I'm going to use my black arrow, click on it. And if I click on the content grabber, you can see it's actually quite a big image. So what I might do is hold down my sh Command Shift to resize it. Okay, up there, bring it down a little bit as well. Okay, and shuffle it across. It's my new cover. All right, super easy. That's it for this video. Let's get on to the next one. Opacity, transparency, see throughiness is what the title of this video is going to be. Okay, and it's so that this black box here you can kind of see through. It's helping me see the text against this. I've done it with this green boxes here. You can see through a little bit. I'll watermark this logo. Page two is a big black box that is transparent. Let's go and do that now. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is grab my rectangle tool. Okay, not the rectangle frame tool. I'm going to give it, before I start drawing anything, I'm going to, well, you, what you might have to do is make sure you've got nothing selected. Then go to the rectangle tool. Make sure the stroke is set to none and the fill of this box is going to be set to black, not registration. Registration is bad. Okay, and I'm going to draw a box roughly to go around the outside. Now it's on top of my type, so I'm going to grab my black arrow. I'm going to right click it. Okay, and I'm going to go to arrange and I'm going to go to send backwards. And by chance, I only have to go back once. Often you'll have to kind of right click it again and go send backwards until eventually you get behind the white type. It depends on when this thing was added to the document because it was last added. Okay, it's on the top of the stack, so it's easy to get behind. So uh, next thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to adjust this and this lady over to the side here because we don't want the black box covering her. But what I'd like to do is lower the opacity. And I just have it selected with my black arrow and up the top here, there's this one called opacity. Okay, and I'm going to slow it down, slower it, it's not a word, but I'll lower it anyway. Okay, and it's just, you decide, you know, how it's going to work with a background image and how low it should go. I might do the same for this green box. Okay, so go and do that, lower this one down as well. It's just for style points. Okay, kind of looks cool having it partly see through. And it's a theme for this uh, book you can see here on page two, this big black box here. It's just a kind of a cool way of having text on a black background. Okay, and we're kind of showing part of the image and yeah, star points. Now we've done it for black boxes. You can do it for anything. You can select anything, lower the opacity, okay, and have washed out text. Might be watermark for the logo. So let's add this guy down the bottom here. Okay, I'm gonna shrink him down, move him down here, but I'm gonna lower the opacity. So he's like a little watermarky thing in the bottom there, which I don't like. But anyway, that is opacity. Let's get on to the next video. Right, I've just opened a file. It's an older file that I've been working on and it come up with this thing that says converted and then I try and save it and it says I got to do a save as. It won't let me save it over the top of the thing I just opened. Why is that? It's because InDesign is updated between when you created this file and where it is now. It might only be six months ago, it might even be two months ago. And there is nothing we can do about it so we just have to live with it. We just go file save and just give it the same name. Okay. And it'll say, would you like to replace? And you say, maybe. What you might do before you go and replace it over the top, I'm pretty confident. I always do it and I never had a problem. I do not want to get you into that problem. I'd like you to go off, make a copy of it somewhere, stick it somewhere hidden in case this all goes horribly wrong for you. At least you can go back to that original. For me, I always replace it with the same name and I don't have any problems. It's just upgrading it to a newer version of InDesign. We just have to live with it. And that is all. Let's get on to the next video. Okay, let's say we can't find the InDesign file. We only have the PDF. Can we open up the PDF in InDesign and start editing it? No. 
Okay, it's not possible. You can place it and it will stick it in like an image, but you can't adjust it. The way to adjust it is that hopefully you're a Creative Cloud subscriber and you've got something called Acrobat Pro or Acrobat DC. If you don't have that installed, go and do that. On my Mac here, there's a little icon, apps, and where is my, mine's called Acrobat DC. Okay, it's the current uh, version of it. And if yours is not installed, install it. Okay, on a PC, I think the same little icon is in the bottom right. Okay, and what you want to do is find your PDF, download it from your email or wherever you've got it, and right-click it and say open with, and make sure it goes into Adobe Acrobat. Now, because this is the pro version and the paid version, mine's called Acrobat Pro DC. For yours, it says Acrobat Reader. It's not going to do any of this. Boo. Okay, but because you're a Creative Cloud license user, uh, it's going to work. And what we're going to do over here on the right is one called Edit PDF. Now, don't get your hopes up too much. You can do additions, but you can't, you can add images, but you can't start swapping them around and using it like InDesign. It's very, very caveman. Now I'm gonna make sure I'm on edit. Along the top here, let's say our dress has changed, I can change it to 100. It's really slow and clunky and jumpy. Okay, so I can do that, no problem. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, and you can see here, let's say I just need to change this, or it's just a typo or a price change. Jumpy, jumpy, that's okay. Okay, so you can do basic stuff in here, basic formatting, you can add images, add text. Okay, add text, click and drag out a box, adding text. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, I'm still waiting for this to catch back up. Mine's a pretty hardcore Mac and it is a little bit dead. <laughs> Here it is, it's back. Okay, so that's kind of last ditch. You just want to make some basic amends and you don't have the InDesign file, you can do it here in Acrobat Pro. Now we've done it in Acrobat Pro. This method works in Illustrator often as well. Uh, Illustrator has some pros and cons to it. It's a little bit harder to use Illustrator if you've never used it before, but there's a little bit more formatting and layout changes you can do. So try either this one, this is the easy version, or Adobe Illustrator and open your PDF in there and make changes. All right, that's it for this video. I hope that's helped. Let's get into the next tutorial. So what did you think? Did you like it? Okay, if you did, please hit the like button and maybe consider subscribing to my channel. It really helps my business. Now, this is just a free video from my larger InDesign course. You can see the full version on bringyourownlaptop.com. Uh, on that site, there is a free cheat sheet you can download. Okay, print it off. Stick it next to your computer, look awesome. The other thing is, is I have lots of other courses there. Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, After Effects, Premiere, Dreamweaver, lots of other ones. So go check that out on bringyourownlaptop.com. Bye.